Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are sorry about the pro presenter. We were speaking the name of Jesus over that computer <laughs> back there. Um, but I'm just grateful for uh, the band and for the ways that you powerfully help us to worship. If prayer and devotion and scripture is part of our heartbeat here, worship is the breath that gives us life to be disciples and followers of Jesus. And so I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for being here this morning to be filled up that you may shine light and ignite change in a world desperate for it. I just want to be honest with you all this morning, just to start with, in our culture, we thrive on guilt. Every advertisement, every Instagram ad, social media ad, ad on TV, uh, the wellness industry, all, dieting, all the things, coaching, career improvements, we thrive on guilt and shame. People thrive on making you feel guilty and shameful to get ahead in life. In fact, if you're a parent in here, you've probably heard the term mom guilt. Who's heard the term mom guilt? Who's felt mom guilt? You're not alone. It's feelings of guilt and shame that mothers have when they don't live up to their own or others' expectation is in their role as a parent. It's like an internal dialogue that consistently and constantly tells you that you are failing as a caregiver. I've heard mom guilt so much in my life. Maybe some of you don't feel mom guilt. Maybe you feel career guilt. Career guilt is feelings of, of guilt for wanting something more and not being grateful for what you have. So you're in a career and you want something more, but you feel guilty for wanting something more and not enjoying where you are right now. It's guilty when you leave a company when you feel like that company needs you. It's a feeling of wanting to quit your job or just staying at the safe job, right? Does anybody here experience, don't raise your hand, your boss might be in the room. Um, <laughs> but some of us here feel this career guilt, right? And then um, maybe some of us feel guilt about the past, right? Some of you brought feelings of guilt and shame for actions that you have done in the past. You take responsibility for things that you don't even have control over and you drag them with you everywhere you go and they start to pop up in your life in ways that are affecting your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, and let me be really honest with you today, it is affecting your spiritual health. Living with guilt and shame affects your ability to have a meaningful and life-giving relationship with the God who created you and wants you to be free to live into a purpose that will shine light and ignite change in this world. That will live into a purpose that leaves you free and helps free others. That, that helps feed others, right? That helps others to flourish in a world where so much is convincing us we have nothing to give. This morning, I want to encourage you to think about how can God change your heart? Because God wants you to help people feel free. God wants you to help people be fed. God wants you to, be, to flourish and others to flourish. But so many of us are living with a heart that causes us to live in shame we live in shame everywhere we go. We are carrying that with us. We feel distant from God, and we are not living into the purpose that God has, us, has for us. So we are going to talk about a habit that sounds really, really terrible, actually. It's called godly sorrow. That doesn't sound fun, right? <laughs> godly sorrow, seriously, er Erica. But I'm telling you that this habit will draw you closer to God and free you from a life of shame, will bring you closer to the heart of God, and will help you to live into the purpose God has for you. So we all hang with me for just a few moments as we talk about godly sorrow. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to read verses 9 and 10. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is what Paul a, a pastor who is in jail is writing to a church that he started in Corinth, um, which is why it's called Corinthians. So he writes this in a letter. Yet now I am happy. He's likely in prison, okay? 
He is not the pastor of a church that he started. He is not living free. He's not eating well. He doesn't feel like he is flourishing, but he is happy. Not because he was made to feel sorry, but because sorrow led to repentance. For you become sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us, which means he's in prison and he wasn't harmed by the people who meant to, to rob from him his freedom, rob from him his ability to flourish, rob from him his ability to eat, because godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. And it leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death and grief. Shame, remorse, grief. But he describes a different way that we can live here in our lives, right? Godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. But the, the thing that most of us are swept up in in this cycle in our world is instead we have shame, right? We feel utter, like, de just depravity. We just feel awful about ourselves. So there's shame, and then there's remorse, and then there's grief, and there's no freedom from regret or from the past. You just keep dragging it with you, and you live your life sadder, with less purpose, less passion, less compassion. You just keep dragging this darkness around with you. And I am here this morning to tell you that we're going to examine that cycle and find a new one. Amen? Who wants a new one this morning? It is time for a new day. It is time to let go of that darkness you are dragging with you everywhere. So we're going to read one more scripture. We're going to read a lot today, actually. So just get those Bibles open and be ready to turn with me. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned. How many of us have sinned? All. You are not special in here if you have sinned today. You are not bringing in a unique story. If there is some time that you have lied, you have cheated, you've taken advantage of somebody, you've suffered from addiction, whatever it is, all of us are dragging something in here that has separated us from God and God's goodness. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to me. You are not special if you have sinned. You are not special if you bring in here shame and pain from something you've done in the past. You are not even special if you are a victim of someone else's sin and evil and brokenness in this world. Do you hear me? We all have experienced, sorry, we have all experienced this brokenness and pain and shame. And so many of us are living like we're the only person who's ever experienced this in life. Look around. You are surrounded by people, all, who are broken and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not leaving you there. Don't worry. Because the next verse, all are justified freely. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. All of us have grace. You are not special if you think you don't deserve it. You are special. You are worthy. All. How many of us? All. Say it loud. All. All of us have grace freely given by Jesus to free us and deliver us from something else. But so many of us are living instead with shame. What is shame? Shame is the intense and painful feeling that you feel like in your gut, in your chest. It's the experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore we are unworthy of love and belonging because of something we experienced, because of something we have done or something we have failed to do. We live in a world full of people who feel like they don't belong. Full of people who feel like they don't belong. Some of you mustered every bit of courage you could find this morning to walk in the doors of a synagogue to experience church, right? Feeling unworthy. Feeling like you have no part in a community. Feeling like you don't belong. And you know what? There is probably 35 times more people out there who couldn't even muster the courage to come in here this morning. Who couldn't even find the courage to say, I'm so unworthy. I don't belong. Shame is feeling like you do not belong. 
like something you have done has completely marked you as a dark and bad person for the rest of your life. And then that shame leads often to remorse. That shame leads to remorse, which is different than repentance. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Shame leads to remorse, and then it leads to grief. This consistent and constant pattern of living your life, wanting something to be the way it was back before it happened, okay? Remorse, let's talk about what remorse is. It's this deep regret, feeling bad for what we have done, okay? It is not feeling sorry, it's just that we feel bad and dark and ugly and stained, unworthy for what we have done. This is where ads start to, start to play on you. This is where those intrusive thoughts in your head start to play on you, right? This is where they start to say, yeah, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. No one likes you. You're not good at your job. You're not good at being a friend. You're not a good parent. This is where the, this leaves just enough room for you to start feeling really bad about yourself. Let's, um, let's read, um, let's go to the next slide. But your iniquities, something else happens when we start feeling remorse. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden God's face from you. Remorse does worse than make you feel bad. In the face of feeling unworthy and unloved and unimportant and dragging that darkness with you, you start hiding from God. You start feeling distant from God. Some of you this morning are like, I can't even tell you the last time I heard from God. Chrysalin was up here talking about feeling worshipful and, and the Spirit of God. I can't even tell you the last time I felt that. Then I'm going to ask you this morning, what things have you started, to got, you've, you've started getting comfortable with doing that is separating you from God? What are the things that you've gotten comfortable with doing that has separated you from God, because when you feel bad, what do you start doing? You fill it up with things that make you feel good, okay? We start filling those holes with things that make us feel bad, and we get further and further and further away from God, and we begin to feel unworthy of His presence or His love or His Spirit. We don't want to spend time with Him. This starts to develop a pattern. And then after that remorse, we start to feel deep grief, okay? We start to feel deep grief. Let's Grief is everything is bad. It's the opposite of the Lego syndrome. If you've not watched that movie, go watch the Lego movie because this guy just goes around going, everything is awesome. The, the person who's living with grief is like, everything is bad. All the time, everything is bad. My career is bad. My family's bad. My food is bad. Everything is bad. We live with this, this lens, these glasses on where we can see no goodness in the world and all we see is darkness. And guess how much fun people are to live with who are dragging around grief and pain like that? I'll tell you, you're zero fun. You're about as much fun as a batch of poison oak. You're not fun. People want to stay away from somebody. You, you make people itch when you just come near. When you, are, when you bring this, everything is bad. Everything is wrong. Nothing is good syndrome with you everywhere you go. No one wants to be around you. There's a different way to live. There's a different way to live, and it's called godly sorrow. It doesn't mean, listen to me, it doesn't mean that we pretend like nothing bad has ever happened. It doesn't mean we pretend like we've never done anything bad. It doesn't mean that we have to live some fake life like we've got everything figured out when we walk into church. There is a different way to live, and it's called godly sorrow. Let's go to the next slide. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, a true repentance, and then it leads to salvation. Let's talk about what these things look like. Godly sorrow is a recognition of brokenness. Right now, I want everybody to recognize, just close your eyes for just a second, and think of something in this world that you know is broken. I'm just going to tell you there's an election coming up. You don't have to close your eyes for too long to know things are broken, right? There are broken things in our world. Godly sorrow simply recognizes there are broken things in our world. There is something that you are doing, you've made some choice or decision, and you had to choose between two not really good things, right? Some of you have brought that in with you this morning. Some of you have had to choose to pretend like something never happened or hide from it or let it never show up. Some of us are pretending like we don't live in a world full of brokenness and dark, darkness. Godly sorrow simply says we are going to recognize that we live in a broken world. Because why? All, who? All 
have fallen short of the glory of God by, by our sin, by our brokenness, by the pain that we bring in here. So godly sorrow simply recognizes that we are broken. Can you go to the next slide? Blessed are those who mourn. These are the words of Jesus. People sat at the feet of Jesus, sad about what their lives looked like, what their synagogues looked like, what their country looked like. They were under Roman rule, and it was oppressive and dark and ugly and terrible. People sat at the feet of Jesus with medical diagnosis, with a, a friend who had leprosy or a sister who was drinking too much or a brother who, who couldn't get his life together. People sat at the feet of Jesus bringing their own things that they could not fit, feel or fix. And Jesus looked at them. These are the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those of you who've looked at your life and the brokenness and the pain and the shame and the darkness of this world. Blessed. I will bring you deep joy, Jesus says. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who have the courage to turn to me, turn to God when there is sorrow. For you will be comforted. That, that initial twinge of pain that you feel, that initial twinge of darkness that you think might have the power to cover it all, it will not happen because why, what does Jesus say? Blessed are those who mourn, for you will be comforted. Bring your sorrow and your grief to God. Bring it to God. And then repent. Repent is not, I feel terrible and bad about what I've done and I want to I hide from it. It is, I have done some bad things and I'm not running that way anymore, but I'm running to Jesus. I'm running to the arms of God. Repent is literally walking this way, realizing it doesn't work. When you get down on your knees and with, with, with just absolute nowhere else to turn, you give that sorrow to God, you have a moment of godly sorrow, and then you turn around and you start doing something different. Repent is turning to God. In remorse, we run away from God because we feel unworthy and unlovable. Repentance turns us towards God because I want you to listen to how, how, how the Bible describes our God. Listen to this scripture. Do you know, do you know the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Do you realize God's kindness is intended, intended to lead you to repentance? When you turn to God, you're not going to get it. You're awful and terrible and the worst person ever. You know what you're going to get? Finally, welcome home. I love you. I want to give you kindness and compassion. I've been waiting for you. I have forbeared for years waiting for you to turn away from the way you are walking, dragging grief and pain and shame and darkness with you everywhere. I have been waiting, forbearing for you to turn to me. I have been patient. I haven't been saying, I haven't been nagging, get over here, get over here. I have patiently used every bit of my grace and power to be calling you unto me. Do you know that kind of richness? You don't have to hide from a God who wants you and all of you. You don't have to keep feeling that great pain and, and, and remorse and, and, and all that stuff anymore. You can simply turn and repent. Remorse, I mean, not remorse, godly sorrow leads to repentance and then it leads to salvation. We throw this word around in the church all the time, right? Salvation, salvation, salvation. Salvation is deliverance to a new day. It, it means that instead of walking this way into the same old day, doing the same old thing in the same old way, you turn and go towards God and you walk into a bright new day, a day where you are freed from all that stuff you've been dragging for too long anyway, a day where you are fed with things that actually feed you up and fill you with the good stuff, not the pretend good stuff that helps you to hide and run away. You are fed. And it is a place where you flourish, where you can walk confidently and proudly into the new day and the purpose that God has for you. And when you do that, when you reach out to God's salvation offered to you through Jesus that says you are lovable, you are worthy, and I can use every part of your story to help other people walk into a new day, you start to shine light and ignite change so other people can experience this. And you're like, tell me a story 
about that, Erica. Does it really happen? First, I want to read this to you. Romans 3, 25 through 26. This is from the message version. I want you to listen. If you don't think that you are worthy of this, God decided on this course of action. God decided to send Jesus Christ to model a way of living without sin and darkness and pain and grief. He decided to send Jesus here and show us with the power of forgiving people from their sins and their pain and their grief and all these things that they've carried away. He decided on this course of action. He decided that Jesus would die on a cross taking place, taking the place of our sins and all of those things. And he decided that he would, he would defeat sin and grief and death forever and ever and raise him again. So we would have no excuses. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public. All of us can see this and experience this. To set the world in the clear with himself. No more muddy griminess in front of him through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. Jesus walked this earth recognizing all of the brokenness and pain here. This is not only clear, but it's now. This didn't just happen 2,000 years ago. Jesus is still, the power of Jesus is still working. The current, this is current history. Because you know what God does? Say it with me. God sets things right. Let's say it one more time. God sets things right. Our God sets things right. Some of you I know are like, Erica, are you sure? Are you sure? I've got a picture, I think. This is my friend Katie Glasser. She um, was the first person to know about Horizon Church about eight years ago. Chris and I um, were moving from Nashville to Tampa and um, she was our realtor and she, we're, Chris had to go back home to do something and she and I went house hunting in the pouring rain in Tampa, Florida, like this week. Um, it wasn't this week, but that's what the rainstorms felt like, the ones we dealt with this week. So we're riding around in her car and she says, um, why are y'all moving here? And I was like, oh, we're going to start a new church. I'm a pastor. And you just never know where this conversation is going to go, especially when it's just the two of you in the car and she's driving. I'm like, I don't know where this is going to go. And she goes, she stops at the stoplight. She goes, oh, cool. Tell me more. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> she doesn't think I'm a weirdo. So I start telling her about how Chris and I prayed for years and years and years for people by name that lived here in Tampa, for friends that he went to high school with, for, for people that we knew. We, we just started praying on our knees for people in this community one day. And a few years later, through patience and forbearance, a few years later, we got a call and they asked us if we'd be interested in starting a new church here in Tampa, Horizon Church. And I wind up in Katie Glasser, who Chris went to high school with in her car, and she says, I think South Tampa needs this. There are so many people who are hiding from all kinds of things that they've done. There is people living with so much pain and addiction that they don't even know what to do. South Tampa needs this, Erica. South Tampa needs this. And I was like, you really think so? Because what she didn't know is I'd already tried this one time and it didn't work out real well starting a new church. And so I was really nervous and worried. Can I actually be a, a good pastor? And in that moment, God used her to speak over my life. You are worthy and you are loved. You are capable and have a purpose. And then she said the best thing ever. She said, how can I help? And from that moment, Katie became the first person to be a part of Horizon Church by asking me, how can I be a part? And I said, well, we're moving here in a few weeks. Just help it introduce us to all the people that you can. And a couple, once we moved here, we sat down and we had coffee together. And this is what I learned about Katie. I thought she was this deeply committed Christian person who'd never, ever known what it was like to not be in church. That was not her story. That was not her story. It was a story of addiction. It was a story of pain. It was a story of shame. It was a story that she decided she was no longer going to live into. She experienced sobriety. She, she quit living thinking she was unworthy and unlovable, and she began to see herself as a child of God, which takes work, right? It takes work to feel like we're worthy. She began to, to have healthier friendships and relationships with her friends and her family, and she started walking into a new day. But here's the deal. Anywhere you go in South Tampa and you meet somebody struggling with addiction, you know, what, you know what they'll tell you? Katie Glasser's told me her story. 
She told me how bad it was, how dark and painful and ugly it was, and how now, I, how now she walks in a new way and a new day. She tells people that story because here's what happens. When we face, when we look clear into godly sorrow, when we say, God, this is breaking my heart, God begins to comfort us and give us the strength and courage to turn toward Him. We repent. It doesn't mean we pretend like that story that we had before doesn't matter. Isn't it? She can't hide from that story. She'll tell you that. You can't hide from it, but you begin to share that story with others. And you are delivered into a new day. And you use that salvation and that deliverance, what God has done for you to help other people experience freedom to flourish in this world. Katie is a prime example of that. She uses every bit of her power to help other people know that they are loved and they are worthy and there is no sense in living with all that pain and guilt and grief. I'm asking you this morning, what is it that you have been carrying for too long? Can you give it to God this morning? Can you give it to God this morning? Can you find courage to quit getting up every day, going through the same motions, and repent, turn a different way, spend time with God, with people in this church, in a small group, serve other people? Can you start to do that? Can you repent? And can you step fully and faithfully into the deliverance that God has from you dragging all of those things with you? There's a song that we used to sing in the Baptist church that I grew up in. It was called The Old Rugged Cross. It is a gift of Jesus, that old rugged cross, for all of us. It wasn't, we weren't saved by this beautiful, amazing firework display. In the, in, we were saved by just a normal, everyday emblem of shame and pain. And Jesus freed us, literally frees us from that. So quit walking in that way and repent and turn towards God. It's time. It's time for us to be free. It's time for us to be fed with the actual good stuff, and it's time for us to flourish so that other people can be free, so that other people can be fed, so that other people can flourish. Horizon Church, can we do that? Can we be free this morning? Can we be fed this morning? Can we agree and turn towards God so that we can flourish, so that others may too? Will you pray with me? God, I pray over these people. Every single one of them that know way too much about the brokenness of this world. And I pray that in those dark places of their heart and soul, God, you will shine light, showing them that your power through Jesus is more powerful than anything they've ever experienced or carried. Free them from it this morning, God. Give them the courage and the strength to turn to you and walk boldly and confidently into a new day. Use their stories of deliverance and salvation to help others know about the fullness of it. May those in our community see the power of your freedom and may you, through your power and grace through Jesus, free them from the chains. May those who are feeding on all kinds of things that will never fill them up, may they feed on your righteousness, your goodness, and your love, and may they be filled. And God, use our stories, our courage, our strength to share with you so that others may flourish too. Amen.